And I really believe that that's a godly thing to honor this and to pray for this nation and to pray for God's blessing. But every time we have a national day of prayer, I've, the last few years I've been at home and I've been a part of the uh, local national day of prayer. And I don't mean this mean spirited or anything like that, but the way that people pray for our nation is pitiful. <laughs> and just look at it this way. We've been having people pray. We've had millions of people pray and do this. And it seems like things have gotten worse. Now, I do admit that we have a reprieve right now. God has done a miracle in this uh, 2016 elections. I just got back from Washington, D.C. last night. Matter of fact, I was supposed to minister in Louisville, and my plane was late, and I missed that ministry. I wasn't able to be there. I think that Rich and Dorothy Van Winkle are here someplace. Where are you? Right here. I was supposed to be at their church, and praise God, I didn't show up, and I heard that you did a great job, brother, and saw some great, great things happen. But um, I was in Washington, D.C., and got to meet with uh, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and pray with him. And I was also with uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, and I met with uh, Congressman Doug Lamborn, who is my senator. And I met with the Representative Mike Johnson, and I got to meet with uh, Sam Brownback, uh, who is the uh, Trump appointed him the Ambassador for International Religious Affairs. And anyway, it was awesome, but every one of these people said, I'm summarizing, but in a nutshell, that all of the gray area is gone. They said they used to be able to walk down the hall and talk to people in the Democratic Party and they would have friends and they could talk to them and stuff. They said, now it is all out war. And they said that people that they used to talk to, they can't even talk to. They are, uh, it's just really bad. And they said that if the Democrats were to win back the um, presidency and uh, the Senate, that it would be all out war on Christians. They gave an example of Nancy Pelosi. I don't know how many of you remember, but right above the speaker's desk in the House of Representatives in Granite up there is In God We Trust. And she took some pictures and photoshopped In God We Trust out. And they have removed So Help Me God from the oaths that they give to people. And the uh, Republicans uh, complain so loudly that they put it back in for a day or two. And now they just eliminated all oaths because they don't want to mention God. And, you know, I said in the 70s when I lived here, I said that I believe that the lukewarmness is gone. People are going to be hot or cold. They are going to be for God or against Him because there's so many people that, that say they're serving God and that they love God, and yet you can't tell it in anything that they do. And I, I wasn't aware, but I really believe it was God that was speaking through me. And my ex, uh, experience this week, every one of these people said that the gray area is gone. The lukewarmness is gone. People are all out, I mean, in hate. And they said that it will be open war on Christians if we lose any of these um, positions. And so anyway, my point is that we've been praying but I believe that we've been praying wrong in a lot of times. And so I'm going to be sharing about what is a godly way to pray. And I've got a book out on this. I've got uh, CDs and DVDs. And let me just emphasize that I've entitled this A Better Way to Pray. I didn't entitle it, You're of the Devil, if you don't pray this way. And I didn't entitle it that, you know, nothing's going to work if you don't pray this way. Because everything I'm going to teach against, I have done. And God loved me, and I loved God. And God is gracious, and even when we're messing up, God loves us, and God will use us as much as He can. But it's not, God just can't lie. He can't be untrue to His Word. And I'll be dealing with a lot of this in more detail, but just as a teaser, let me share with you out of uh, James chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Submit yourselves therefore unto God, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. It says he will flee from you. You resist the devil. And there's so many Christians saying, Oh God, please do something about the devil. Oh God, please take care of this. And you aren't taking your authority. And God, if he was to answer your prayer, would have to become a liar. 
He told you, you resist the devil. I give you authority. And so if we aren't praying correctly, you can be sincere and yet sincerely wrong. And everything that I'm going to be teaching against, I have done at one time or another. And I loved God and God loved me, but also I wasn't getting very good results. I'm getting a lot better results now. I don't claim that I've understood everything about it, but I am saying that I'm seeing some awesome things happen. You probably wouldn't have recognized, but as they were playing this video and as Jamie walked out singing that song, I only touched the hem of his garment, she walked right by our granddaughter who has a distinction that very few people in the world has. And that is that she was born one year after her father died. And some people say, how did that happen? Her father, our son, was dead for five hours and in a morgue, stripped naked, in a cooler with a toe tag on, pronounced dead. And they called us and Jamie and I agreed and he sat up and started talking. And after being dead for five hours, he came back from the dead with no brain damage, no more than he had before. <laughs> and he's alive and well and working for us. And I mean, it's just awesome what God has done. So I don't claim that I figured it all out. I had somebody tell me something back there tonight and I said, look, I don't know the answer. I said, I don't understand everything, but I don't let what I don't know stop me from doing what I do know. And I have learned some things about prayer that I am seeing greater results than I've ever seen. And let me just say this to challenge you before I even get into this. I'm going to say some things that I can guarantee you will rub you the wrong way. I've had people who've been friends with me for 20 years get up and walk out as I teach on this because I'm going to attack a lot of religious concepts. But before you get upset with me, just think about this. How's your prayer life working? Most people, not everybody, but most people would say that, man, I've been praying for years. I've prayed for this and nothing's happening. And you aren't seeing the right results. And yet people will fight to hold on to the belief system that isn't working. So I'm just challenging you from the get-go to open up your heart. And I believe that this is what God has laid on my heart to share with you. And if you will receive it, this could change your life. When I have people come up to me and they say, I've read your book on a better way to pray. And if they still like me, I know that they are stark, raving, mad fanatics. Because I can guarantee you religious people, anybody who's just on the outskirts of Christianity and doesn't want to go completely with God and follow Him with everything they've got, they aren't going to like this. And so I just encourage you before you reject everything, listen and open up your heart, and I believe God will bear witness with this. Let's start over to Matthew chapter 6, and this is where Jesus started teaching on prayer. His disciples came to him. This is also repeated over in Luke chapter 11, and I'll be turning over there and comparing some of those verses. But in Matthew chapter 6, it says in verse uh, 5, and when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray. Now, I'm aware there's no period there, but I'm just going to stop right here before I go any further. Don't be like hypocrites. Hypocrites love to pray. Ashley right here, his son was up listening to me teach on this, and he came down and told Ashley and Carly, his wife, and says, man, you and mom are hypocrites. <laughs> And he says, what are you saying? And he says, well, Andrew said hypocrites love to pray. <laughs> I'm not saying that godly people don't love to pray, but I am saying that hypocrites love to pray. Did you know that Muslims pray, Buddhists pray, Hindus yeah. pray? Just because you pray doesn't mean that you are connecting with God. The Muslims will bow five times a day and pray towards Mecca, and they're probably more disciplined in their prayer life than you are, and yet that does not mean that they are in contact with God. They are not in contact with the same God that we serve. Prayer in itself is not anything. Prayer is a vehicle. It's a way to commune with God and to have relationship with God. But if we are doing it religiously and just following our uh you know, the things that we've been taught, it, it could be doing you more damage than good. 
There's very few people that will say that because most people just think, well, if you're praying, it doesn't matter how you pray. Just as long as you pray, it's good. No, you can, you can destroy yourself with prayer. One of the first things I do when we, it seems like women seem to be more concerned about their marriage than men are. Men basically don't even know they've got a problem until they're served with divorce papers. But women will come to me and say something like, you know, would you please pray for my husband? I don't understand what's going on. And one of the first things I tell them is quit praying for your husband. And people are just shocked. Like, why would you tell anybody to quit praying? Because I've heard your prayers. And they'll spend 45 minutes. God, he hates me. He hates the kids. He hates you. He hates the dog. He beats the dog. He spends our money. He's a slob. He doesn't clean up after himself. He burps, he does, and you just spend 45 minutes complaining about what a jerk this guy is, and then you say, save him in Jesus' name. Five seconds of positive is not going to counter 45 minutes of griping and complaining, and yet that's what a lot of people call prayer. Matter of fact, Charles Capps one time was praying, and, and the Lord stopped him right in the middle of the prayer and said, Charles, what are you doing? And he says, I'm praying. And God says, that's not praying, it's complaining. And there's a lot of us that complain and we, we go in and, oh God, the doctor said this and we're crying and telling, oh God, what's going to happen to my children? And that's not prayer. Matter of fact, I'm going to show you right here that prayer isn't to, mis to inform poor misinformed God what your need is. It says he knows what you have need of more than you do. Prayer isn't an opportunity for you to just throw up all of your unbelief on God and say all of this junk out of your life. And yet that's what most people call prayer. They think it's not prayer unless they can cry and talk about how bad everything is and they think that's really good. That's just griping and complaining and it really solidifies your problem by you repeating it over and over and focusing on it. Jesus said, don't be like hypocrites. They love to pray. Hypocrites love to pray. I had a man come one time. I don't know how many of you were aware of Larry Lee's teaching on could you not tarry one hour, but that was very, very popular in the body of Christ maybe 20 or 30 years ago. And they use the Lord's Prayer right here in Matthew chapter 6 to teach you how to spend an hour in prayer every day. And anyway, th there was nothing wrong with the basics of it. But one of the guys from his church came to where I was and he walked in and he says, so how much time do you spend praying every day? And I thought, that's a strange question. Why would he ask that? And the only reason I could see that he wanted to know was so that he could compare himself with me and hopefully come out better and make himself feel really good. It was for his own ego that he was asking this. And before I could answer it, I was thinking about how do I answer this? The Lord just spoke to me and he says, how much time did you spend with Jamie yesterday? And I said, well, I spent all day with her. And how much time did we spend talking? I can't tell you. I didn't time it and say, all right, visit, <laughs> fellowship. But we spent all day together and we talked and we were with each other all day. Matter of fact, one of the reasons that I knew Jamie and the relationship I had with her was different than any other girl I ever dated was I didn't have to impress her. Jamie and I could just sit together and we didn't even have to talk and we just enjoyed being together. It didn't have to be something going on all of the time. But see, there's a lot of people that, that you've got to pray an hour a day. You've got to do this and you've got to assume a certain position. I've heard people get up and talk about how you, how you have to build an altar and how they talk about the colors and put in a little cross and put a prayer bench and do all of this. And again, I'm not saying you can't do that stuff, but that is not prayer as such. That Hypocrites love to pray. There's a lot of people that spend huge amounts of time in prayer and it's not doing you a bit of good, it's destroying you. Thank you for that thunderous silence. <laughs> but this is how Jesus started off talking about prayer. Don't be like hypocrites, they love to pray. Amen. Now that I got your attention, he says... Um, they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. In other words, the reason they love to pray is to receive the praises of people, to have people come by and pat them on the 
back and, man, aren't you a godly person? You're so awesome. I remember in the church that I grew up in, these, these guys that I knew, they would just talk normal like all the rest of us Texans. But when it came time to pray, Oh, most heavenly Father, we know that thou art... And they start talking in Elizabethan English. <laughs> now, if you talk in Elizabethan English all of the time, well, then that's fine. Pray that way. But if you have to change your whole tone and start using these and thous and stuff like this, excuse me, but you're religious at best and a hypocrite, probably. God's not like that. What would happen if you came into my office and you sat down and, oh, Andrew, we know that thou art somebody special, and, that, and you start doing it. I guarantee you, I'd look at you and think something's wrong with you. That's not the way you talk to me. It's not the way you talk to anybody else. And if you talk to God like that, you're religious or a hypocrite or both. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> this is when some of my friends got up and walked out. <laughs> I'm not saying these things to hurt anybody, but I'm just saying that religious people do it so that they can be accepted. I was just praying with Mitch McConnell and Mike Pompeo, and we had some other people there. We had some Baptist and some church God and other people, and it was, it was interesting to hear their prayers. The Baptists prayed exactly like the Baptists that I grew up in. The Church of God prayed exactly like that. The uh, independents prayed another way. We've all got our religious stuff that we've been taught, and I'm telling you, it doesn't amount to anything when it comes to talking to God. I could listen to a person pray and tell you what church you go to. That's religion. It says, verily, I say unto you, they have their reward. You know what their reward is? That little pat on the back that you got, that was it. <laughs> That's all you're going to get. You aren't going to get anything from God. God's not into religious prayers. And then he goes on to say in the next verse, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which is in secret shall reward thee openly. This doesn't mean that you literally have to go into a closet because Jesus prayed openly. The 12th chapter of John, he prayed, O oh, Father, glorify your name, and an audible voice came out of heaven and answered him. You don't physically have to be in a closet, but this is just saying don't pray for show. Don't pray so that people could hear you. When you, like I was with these guys praying this way, and they weren't praying to God. They were praying for Mitch McConnell and for Mike Pompeo. They were praying to be heard by men. They were preaching a sermon as they prayed. You might get a pat on the back from men, but God doesn't care about that. That's religious. Amen or oh me. And then in verse 7, And when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. This says heathens love to pray. Heathens pray. But they use vain repetitions. They have mantras that they repeat over and over. Such as, you know what, I'm borrowing this church. They're letting me use this church. If you don't like what I'm saying, don't get mad at Ben or at Don, amen. That I did not submit my message, and they, this is not an approved message. So don't get mad at them. But I'm telling you, if you're praying the rosary and saying so many Hail Marys and Our Fathers, that's vain repetitions. That is not godly. That does not touch the heart of God. If you're going through, and I used to have a formula that I would pray, Oh God, we come before you so humbly today. We're so unworthy, but we ask you for your mercy. And then you'd throw out some prayer and then, Oh God, please forgive. And you just spent the whole time ducking and, Oh God, please don't strike me dead and stuff. And that's just religious. 
Some of, but oh, compared to God, I'm nothing. Well, then instead of talking about your nothing, let's talk about how awesome God is to love somebody as, awesome, as ugly as you are. Amen. It goes on to say right down here, you enter into his gate. Well, it says in Psalms 100, you enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him. He starts by saying, our father, which art in heaven. You start by drawing on this relationship and talking about your heavenly father, not God almighty, which he is God almighty. I'm not saying that we forget that, but we need to draw on this, on this love relationship. You know, if I was in your home and if your child came in and they entered into the kitchen and then they fell down on the floor and they said, oh, mom, I know I'm unworthy and I know I didn't make my bed and I know I haven't followed all of the instructions and I didn't do all of my chores, but please, could you give me something to eat? Could I have just a little bit, maybe not a full meal, but just enough to keep me going because I'm not unworthy? If they came in and talked like that, I could guarantee you your relationship with your child is not good. <laughs> and yet this is how Christians pray. But you know, a child, they just run in and, Mom, give me something to eat. That's what this says. Give us this day our daily bread. It didn't say, oh God, would you please give? No, it's a demand. Give us this day our daily bread. You should be drawing on a relationship with the Father, knowing your position and come in boldly and say that, man, I receive my needs meant because I know that you love me. But the way that we've been taught to approach God is this unworthy thing. We, as a beggar, oh God, I'm so unworthy. I am nothing. I have nothing. I can do nothing. You have already violated the Word of God with that attitude. And you said, well, Jesus said in John chapter 15 that without me, you can do nothing. I agree with that 1,000%. I agree that without Jesus, I am nothing. But I am never without Jesus. And he has promised he would never leave me nor forsake me. And if you have this unworthy attitude and come before God as a red-headed stepchild that doesn't believe God wants to move in your life, you've already hurt yourself yeah. before you even get started. Is there anybody I hadn't hit yet? <laughs> I'm telling you all of us at some time or another, we have this attitude, oh God, I'm so unworthy. Well, sure you're unworthy in yourself, but you're a brand new person in Christ. And all of your sins have been cast into the deepest sea. And for you to approach God that way is no different than a child coming in and falling down and begging. You know, I had this dog that I got my mother when I went to Vietnam. And th this dog was three-fourths German Shepherd and one-fourth Chow. And I got it to be a watchdog for my mother when I was gone. And anyway, this was a mean looking dog, but it was beat with a trace chain, the person that had it before me. And so it, it looked big. It would run and hit the fence and the whole fence would move. But if you were to open up the gate, that dog would have hurt itself trying to get out of the way. <laughs> and when it came up to you, it had come running across the yard and it'd get about five or six feet away from me and it'd stop and lay over on its side and whimper and scoot up to me like I was going to hit it. And I named this dog Honey because it looked like honey. So anyway, I was out and the Lord was teaching me some of these exact things that I'm telling you and telling me about the attitude that I had. And I went out and sat on the back porch to think about it. And here comes my dog running across the yard and it gets five or six feet away and rolls over on its side and gets to whimpering and scooting up to me. And I lost my temper at this dog. And I said, honey, one time, you know, it's hard to get mad at your dog when it's named honey. <laughs> and I said, honey, one time I'd like you to come and jump up on me like a normal dog and act like I'm not going to beat you. I said, people think I'm mean to you and do all of this. And I was just reading this dog, the right act. And God spoke to me and he says, that's the way I feel about you. <laughs> He says, one time I'd like you to just come and jump in my lap like I'm your father and that life I've forgiven you. I'm telling you, the way most of us approach God, we, we destroy our prayer before we even get there. We aren't drawing on the relationship. We aren't standing using our authority. It's depressing. The reason people don't pray more is because, man, the way you pray is depressing. 
All you do is sit there and talk about what a mess you are and how bad your situation is. And God, I don't deserve anything. And I don't even know why you love me. And then you wonder why you don't enjoy talking to the Lord. You know, when I first got turned on to the Lord, I used to set an alarm clock and pray two hours at a time. And I, the first time I did that, I thought after five minutes, I must be at least at the one hour mark. And I looked at the thing. And I mean, praying for two hours, well, it was like pulling teeth. It was so hard. But I did this for months, maybe a year or more. And, and anyway, one time I, I prayed from 7 till 9 o'clock in the morning. And one time I was studying the Word and I was praying and God was speaking to me and I was having a wonderful time. And I looked at the clock and it was nearly time for me to go pray. And I just said, Father, I'm sorry, but you know how I feel anyway. So I'm just going to tell you that I start dreading this about a quarter till seven. I said, I dread this prayer time. It seems like it just drags on forever. And I said, I don't mean it bad, but that's just the way I feel. And uh, the Lord spoke to me. He says, don't feel bad. He says, I start dreading it. It is 630. <laughs> and I thought, well, if God's not enjoying this, and if I'm not enjoying this, why am I doing this? And it just set me free. But I can tell you what, God doesn't like your prayer time any more than you do. All you do is go in and remind him of what an ogre he is and stuff like this. And you just spew out doubt and unbelief. There's a better way to pray than that. Amen. And he goes on to say, he says, don't use vain repetitions as a heathen do for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. You know what a good prayer is? Help. In Jesus' name. That's a great prayer. If you look at Jesus, his prayers were pretty short. Peace, be still, be healed, come out. He didn't pray long prayers. Did you know that there's only twice in the New Testament that Jesus prayed all night long? Now, it may look like more than that because the four Gospels record the same event. But if you look at it in a chronological order... There's twice that Jesus prayed all night long, and, and it was because he was so busy during the day ministering to people that that's the only time he could get any free time with, the, with his Father. But Jesus didn't pray great long prayers. It goes on to say here, it says, For be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. Again, most people, the way they approach God, it's like, oh God, the doctor said this, the banker said this. Did you hear what my wife said? And we spend 15 minutes telling God the situation because he's got millions of people asking for his attention. And you got to tell him that yours is really serious so that it'll get to the top of the pile so that he doesn't <laughs> neglect you. You got to impress on him how bad it is. And if you could work up a few tears yeah. and stuff, that'll really touch his heart and get him to do something. This says that your father knows what you have need of before you even pray. Prayer is not an opportunity to tell misinformed God about your need. You know, when I understood this, it has changed my prayer life. I started all night prayer meetings when I lived over here in Arlington, Texas, praying for Dallas, Fort Worth. And I mean, we never lasted past one o'clock in the morning. Everybody was gone. So I'd eventually go home, but our whole thing was, oh God, look how bad things are and God. And I just talk about how bad as if God didn't know. And I actually heard myself. I said this one time over here in Arlington, Texas, I was praying. And I said, God, if you love Dallas Fort Worth half as much as I do, you would send a revival. And as soon as I said that, I thought, something's wrong with this picture. I'm claiming that I love these people more than God does. And I had to beg God and get God motivated. God wants to bless you more than you want to be blessed. God wants to send revival more than you want revival. Matter of fact, if you want revival, it's because God has already touched your heart. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, the way we pray begging God like, God, I don't know why you aren't disposed to do this, but for whatever reason, I'm just begging you to change. You aren't trying to get God to change. You don't need to beg God for anything. 
Matter of fact, let me turn over to, let's see. Let's turn over to Mark chapter 11. Let me show you this same passage in, in uh, excuse me, Luke chapter 11. Jesus taught this exact same thing right after those verses that I read is when he started in Matthew chapter 6 saying, pray this way, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And I could spend a lot of time teaching on that, but I want to skip over here to Mark chapter 11. This is the exact same thing that he taught. It's just recorded in a different gospel. In verse 2, he said unto them, when you pray, say, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. As in heaven, so in earth, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then in verse five, he says, and he said unto them, which of you shall have a friend and shall go unto him at midnight and say unto him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine is in his journey has come to me and I have nothing to set before him. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needeth. And I could spend a lot more time on this, but as a whole, the way that this has been interpreted and taught is that God is not disposed to answer your prayers. There is a resistance on God's part, and you've got to just badger him. You've got to stay after God. And if he won't listen to you, then call the church prayer team and get a hundred people to put pressure on him. And if that doesn't work, go on the internet and get a thousand people. And finally, we'll put so much pressure on God that we just lay hold of God and twist his arm until the miracle comes out. You got to force God. It's your importunity that makes God do things. That's the opposite of what this is saying. Here's what he's saying. How many of you have a friend that if somebody came to your house and if you didn't have anything to feed them and if there weren't 24 hour a day, uh, you know, 7-Elevens and things like this, today it's a different situation for us than it was then. But if you had a need, somebody came to your house late at night and if you couldn't meet it, how many of you have a friend that if you went over and said, could I please have something to help my friend? How many of you have a friend that is say, no, I'm in bed. Leave me alone. I don't want to help you. How many of you have friends like that? Here's one hand. Let me just suggest that that person's not a friend. Yeah. They might be an acquaintance, but what he's doing, he's saying, look, people treat you better than this. If you went to a friend, I can guarantee you, I could go to any of these people here that I consider to be my friends. And if I had a need, these people would do things for me. They would help me. If you have a friend, a friend's not going to tell you, I'm in bed. Leave me alone. Don't bother me. Jesus is saying, if people treat you better than this, why do you think that you have to beg God and plead with God and make God do it? And to prove to you that's his point, read the rest of it. Read it in context. If you take a scripture out of context, if you take the text out of context, all you have left is con. Amen. Look at the rest of it right here. It says in verse 9, And I say unto you, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will he give him a stone? See, he's, comparing, he's continuing the comparison. Actually, it's a contrast, not a comparison. He's saying, people treat you better than this. Why do you think your heavenly father who died for you would treat you worse than a human being who's a fallen person and has problems and stuff? Why do you put more confidence in friends than you do in God? What would happen if you went to your friend and asked them for help the way that you go to God and ask him for help? What if you went to your friend and said, you know, I know I'm not the best friend and, I, and I've done this wrong and I've talked about you. And if you just mention all of the sorry things that you've done, 
and I'm no good, but I'm in desperate need. Oh, please help me. And you go to begging. I, they might help you once or twice, but you know what? They aren't going to want to help you very much. They aren't, when they'll see you coming, they'll want to go the other direction because all you do is just gripe and complain. I'm preaching better than you're listening. <laughs> What he's saying is, if you, if a son asks a father for a piece of bread, how many of you are going to give him a stone that he could bite on a stone and break a tooth? How many of you would do that for your child? Hopefully nobody's going to raise their hand on this one. And then he says, um, if he asks a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? How many of you, if your child asks, could I have a piece of fish? You give him a snake instead. <laughs> Hopefully none of us would do something like that. Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? And then he says in the next verse, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? What he's doing is drawing a contrast. He's not saying that God is like this friend, that he's not liable to answer you. God is not like this with his arms folded saying, you aren't worthy. I don't want to bless you. You sorry thing. What makes you think I would answer your prayer? You better grovel in the dirt a little bit more. You better fast and pray more. You better deny yourself. You got to do something. Penance. Make a bargain. Promise that you'll go to church the rest of the year, not miss a single thing if I'll answer this prayer. See, God's not like that. God's got his arms open. He's trying to bless you. He's already, the scripture says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, that he's already blessed us with all spiritual blessings. I'm going to deal with this more as I go through this series, but the truth is everything you're asking for, God's already done. I've got a book entitled, You've Already Got It. And the subtitle is, So Quit Trying to Get It. And it's got a picture of a dog chasing his tail. Because, you know, just like a dog chasing his tail, if he was to catch it, he'd find out he already had it. <laughs> Whatever it is that you're asking God for, you've already got it. If you're asking to be well, the Bible says, by his stripes you were healed. It's already been done. Well, no, I don't have it yet. Yes, you do. You just don't know what you got. I'll teach on that more and explain it more. But the truth is, God is wanting to give to you. He's already supplied everything. You don't have to get God to bless you. I couldn't tell you how many times I've had people around me, I've heard them pray, oh, God, just bless me. You're already blessed with all spiritual blessings. Oh, God, make me righteous. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, 24, you were created in righteousness and true holiness. You're already righteous and holy. Oh, God, just give... I've had people come up and say, God, just give me joy. I need joy. When the Bible says that you had the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, joy, uh, all of these things. And it says, if you believe, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. You don't need God to give you joy. He's already given you joy. You need to start drawing out by faith what God has already placed on the inside of you. The way we approach God, we approach Him as if we have nothing, can do nothing, but oh God, you can do all things. You've already destroyed your prayer the moment you approach Him that way because you aren't standing in what the Word of God says. Word of God says you're blessed with all spiritual blessings. You are the head and not the tail. You are in heavenly places. Satan is under your feet and on and on, and yet we don't approach him based on what he says. We approach him based on how I feel, what my circumstances say, which is unbelief, and you are speaking forth that stuff, and you are doing more damage than you are good. I'll say this. I, I'm leaving in a few days. <laughs> Ben will fix this for all of the people that attend here, but most of you would be better off to quit praying the way you're praying because you are speaking doubt and unbelief. Now that needs some explanation. If you replace it with godly type of prayer, well, then that's wonderful. But I'm saying that a lot of what we are doing 
is causing more damage because you are speaking forth your fear, your doubt, your hurt, your pain. And a lot of people, well, God knows. God wants me to just pour my heart out to him. No, he doesn't want you. He turned around to, to Peter when Peter says, Lord, forbid it. They'll never do this to you. He said, get behind me, Satan. You savor not the things that are of God, but the things that are of men. A lot of what we're saying is inspired by the devil. It is our own hurt. It's our own feeling. And contrary to psychology, it is not healthy for you to just spew out all of your unbelief. And because you start it with Father and end it with in Jesus' name does not mean that it was godly prayer. I know some of you feel like, man, you're pulling the rug out from under me. Before we can build a good foundation, you got to jackhammer and take out all of the wrong stuff. So I am going to get into some godly things about prayer. But first of all, I'm just countering some of these religious traditions. Look over in the 18th chapter of Luke. In Luke chapter 18, in verse 1, it says, He spake a parable unto them to this end, that man ought always to pray and not to faint, saying, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, nor regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and the same came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And people take this to say that's the way that God is. We got to just wear him out. We got to ref we got to refuse to take no for an answer. You lay hold of God, lay hold of the horns of the altar and shake it until God comes out. And that's the way that people interpret this. And look in verse 6. And the Lord said, "Hear what the unjust judge saith." Notice he was an unjust judge. God's not comparing himself to an unjust judge. This is a contrast. It's not a comparison. Verse 7, And shall not God avenge his own elect which cried day and night unto him, though he, not speaking of he, God, but he, the unjust judge, bear along with them. It's a contrast, not a comparison. God is not an unjust judge. You don't have to beg and plead. He is a just judge. When you come before him, he wants to move in your behalf. This is not saying that God is like this unjust judge, but it's saying that you expect better treatment from an ungodly person. that God Almighty loves you less than an unjust judge. And then he says, Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cried day and night unto him, though he, this unjust judge, bear along with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. That's God's attitude. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. The thing that hinders God from answering our prayers and doing these things is because of unbelief, because we aren't in faith, because we come with this attitude that, God, you're a far-off God. God, you don't want to move in my behalf. God, I've got to beg you. I've got to plead with you. And I'll get into this in more detail. I'm just going to say this, and I don't have time to explain it tonight, but I will deal with it, deal with it this week. But when it comes to praying for, like, our nation... We're saying, oh God, this nation has sinned against you and we got to confess our sins and get all of this out here and we got to go back and make atonement for what the white man did to the Indians 200 years ago and what the, the white man did to the blacks black, back during slavery. You know, there's actually something in Congress where they are trying to do reparations and pay every single black person in this country so much money for the way they were treated. 
they have put that in front of Congress. What I want to say, Jamie brought this out, well, we ought to also pay all of the, I forgot exactly how many, 700,000 white guys that died during the Civil War bringing them independence. Where are you going to stop with this? That's wrong. God won't move until I do all of these things and until we just grovel in the dirt and, and, and beg and plead more. Your sins were forgiven when you got born again. God is not holding your sins against you. The only thing that is holding up the answer to your prayer is our unbelief because we feel so unworthy. We are empowering the devil. We are allowing our conscience to condemn us and we don't have the confidence and the courage and the authority that God has bought for us through Jesus and we're approaching him like a lost man that doesn't have a savior. We pray in the name of Jesus, but the truth is we actually believe that it's going to be according to our goodness. And so all somebody's got to do is say, hey, you committed sin. You haven't studied the word the way that you should. What makes you think you're worthy? And all of a sudden your total confidence just crumbles because your faith wasn't in God. It was in you. If you pray and use the name of Jesus properly, what you're saying is, Father, not because of who I am, but in Jesus' name. I expect to receive because of Jesus. You know, the scripture says, agree with your adversary quickly while you're in the way. And there's multiple ways of applying that, but one of the ways I apply it is when the devil comes and says, you aren't worthy, what makes you think God would use you? Instead of me trying to justify myself and say, wait a minute, I've studied the word more than I ever have. I've been praying, I've studied, I've fasted, I've... The moment you start justifying yourself and trying to make yourself worthy, Satan has won because you may be better than you were. You might be better than I am, but you have come short of the glory of God and you do not deserve any answers to prayer based on your goodness. The right way to respond is when your enemy comes and condemns you. Agree with your adversary and say, you know what? You're right. I don't deserve anything. I think I'll pray in the name of Jesus. And I'll get it through who Jesus is. I'll get it on the basis of his righteousness. I'm standing holy not because I am holy in myself, but because I am born again righteous and holy. See, that's using the name of Jesus properly. But if you say in the name of Jesus, but you're saying, God, I'm worthy. God, I've prayed. I've done more than ever before. Now will you move? You have just used the name of Jesus in vain. You aren't trusting in Jesus. You're trusting in yourself and you're taking the name of Jesus in vain. Amen or oh me. If you can't say amen, say oh me. I know that, you know, this is kind of like going to the doctor or to the dentist. Sometimes it hurts before it feels better. But we've got, I think that prayer is probably the worst used thing in the body of Christ. But people basically just say, pray. As long, it, just however you pray. It doesn't matter. Just pray. Pray. That's wrong. There's right and wrong praying. And I tell you, the way most of us are praying is actually loosing the devil by us focusing on the bad, condemning ourselves, speaking about our unworthiness instead of our Savior who loves us in spite of our unworthiness. There's death and life in the power of the tongue, Proverbs 18, 21. And if you are speaking wrong things, you are releasing death and not life. And I'm telling you, that's wrong praying. There's a better way to pray. Like I said at the very beginning, everything I've taught against tonight, I have done. And yet God loved me and I loved God and God did not hate me and God didn't reject me, but I get a lot better results now that I've learned a better way to pray than what I used to. I'm not saying that you're of the devil. I'm not saying that God hates you, but I am saying that many of us are praying totally wrong and you're going to get totally wrong results if you're praying wrong. So as we celebrate a day, a national day of prayer, we don't need to come before God talking about how unworthy we are. Now, I think it's good that we acknowledge that, Father, we do not deserve your blessings in this nation. God gave us a godly nation. We have some forefathers 
that were some of the, I believe, I heard my pastor say this, that if the book of Hebrews chapter 11 was being written today, where it talks about the heroes of faith, I believe that some of the founding fathers of America would be listed in there. They are some of the most godly people. God gave us a godly nation, a godly heritage, and we are so far from it that, that in the Senate recently, in the last month or so, they took a Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act where if a child survived an abortion and was perfectly healthy outside of the mother's womb, that the doctor could kill it. Infanticide. Man, that's, we've fallen a long ways. I think it's good to acknowledge that and to realize that we don't deserve the blessings of God, but to wallow in that and forget that, man, God has forgiven us and that you as a believer can stand there and release the power of God. That's the wrong way to pray, just coming before God and begging and pleading as if we don't have a Savior. We do have a Savior. Man, I could, if I had time, I could turn to the test, to the uh, prayer of Daniel. And Daniel confessed that, man, we are deserving of everything you've done. Ezekiel said that our sins have been punished less than what we deserve. And yet each one of them came out and basically said, I am not praying for favor because we deserve it. I'm praying for favor because you are a gracious and merciful God. And they drew on the mercy of God instead of their own righteousness. So I'm not saying that we don't deserve judgment. If we got what we deserve, we'd all be toast. But we have a Savior. And you have the right and the authority to draw on that and come before Him and pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. And I'm going to be talking about the authority that God has given us. Most people pray like a beggar instead of like a person that's been given authority and power. We are asking God to do what he told us to do. And I'm going to be sharing a lot of things with you that I can.
can guarantee you will help you tremendously. But the first message here is basically just about hypocrites love to pray. And you need to readjust some things. You need to, you need to get rid of your religious traditions and just pray in the way that you feel and saying whatever you want to say. And you need to order your conversation correctly. I'll be using these scriptures more, but it says, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good. It tells you how to enter God. It tells you to come before him with praise and with thanksgiving. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 47, 48 says that because you didn't serve God with joyfulness and gladness of heart, therefore God is going to bring judgment upon you. Now, we have been redeemed from that judgment. Christ became a curse to redeem us from the curse, but it still shows you that God was not pleased when we didn't come before him drawing on what he's done. And instead, we came before him with all of our hurts and pains and things like this. Now, there's a place to cast our care over on the Lord, but it's not 45 minutes belly aching in five seconds saying, thank you, Jesus. Man, it should be the opposite. God, I've got some serious problems. The doctor told me I'm going to die. But praise God, if I die, I get to spend eternity with you in heaven. Amen. We sing the song, when we all get to heaven, and then the doctor tells you you're going there and you cry. <laughs> Something's wrong with this picture. Somewhere you're a hypocrite. I hope I'm not too subtle. I'm not saying these things because I'm mad at anybody. I'm just, you know, I've only got a limited amount of time and I'm just trying to get my point across. I hadn't got time to tiptoe around the issues and stuff. If you love a person, you need to tell them the truth. And I'm telling you, God, is, he's been really straight with me that a lot of the ways that I've prayed have hurt me, have hurt other people. And so everything I'm saying to you, God has said to me, but I've changed and I've learned and because of it, I'm seeing better results now than I've ever seen. And I believe that God wants the same thing for you. And I'm telling you, if you, if you follow these things, this could tra transform your life. I've seen the dead raised, blind eyes open, deaf ears open. I've seen miracle upon miracle. I've seen financial provision. I've learned how to cast my care over on the Lord. I don't worry about stuff. I'm not stressed out. We got 650 employees, which Paul gets stressed out. That's what I hired him for. <laughs> when I hired him, he says, what are you going to pay? And I said, that's your first worry. <laughs> Amen. I don't worry about stuff. I've learned how to cast my care over on the Lord. And, and you can do it. I'm not saying I've arrived, but I've left. And I'm telling you, I'm seeing results. 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 And